my name's Oliver. I did graduate from uh, uh, from Coventry. I did uh, business studies um, or global business, uh, my bachelor's, and then shortly after, I uh, did a postgraduate at the University of Cambridge um, in entrepreneurship. So I've had an interest in starting my own business for quite some time. Um, and was constantly throughout my time at university looking for, for gaps in the market. Um, entrepreneurs often use this cheesy line, you know, looking for the pain points, um, looking for the things that I could solve to make people's lives easier or better um, or, or, or more convenient. Um, and actually it was whilst uh, uh, during my time at, at Coventry that I came up with this idea of, of making a uh, more affordable graduation gowns. Um, I graduated, I paid, I don't know, 50, 60 pounds to rent a gown for about an hour, spent a lot of my day queuing up to get the gown, took a quick photo with it, and then spent a huge amount of my day queuing up to give it back. And I thought this was really inefficient and there was a complete lack of choice. Um, I realized that my university and pretty much every university out there funnels everybody to a single supplier. Um, and when you get a monopoly in a market, what happens is the prices get really inflated, there's uh, no incentive for that supplier to innovate or to really put its customers at the heart of what it's doing. So I thought there's a big, big opportunity here. Is there a market that's big enough to start a company? Um, I did a little bit of research and found out that there's around a million people who graduate from the UK every year, each spending 50, 60 pounds to graduate. So uh, a quick extrapolation values that market at 60 million pounds annually. So there's definitely opportunity. Um, and so I started Churchill Gowns. Um, so I realized that there was a little bit of a gap in the market. I then started thinking, well, how can I make this in a more ethical and more sustainable way? Um, so I looked at the types of fabrics that I could make the gowns out of. And very quickly, I came up uh, against recycled PET. PET are the plastics that are kind of like hard plastics. So they're plastic bottles or um, shampoo bottles, that type of thing. Um, and there's really well-established businesses um, that have started to use this, but it's not really widespread. There's still a lot of concern about these types of materials, a lot of skepticism. People's knee-jerk reaction is, is it really shiny or is it cheap? Is it inferior in some way? Um, and the, the basic answer to that is a recycled plastic is the same as any other plastic um, and a lot of our clothes are already made of plastics um, most clothing now is made of polyester of some kind um, so i thought wow how cool is that i can take plastic that would ordinarily be you know, taking up space in landfill and do something really good with it um, and so i thought that's super exciting um, before i go on i'll show a quick video which kind of explains a little bit more about what our brand is and what it is we're trying to achieve. We've all got our tassels in a tangle about plastic waste, especially when it ends up in landfill or polluting our oceans. Sometimes the scale of the problem seems so big we feel powerless to do anything about it. But at Churchill Gowns we're on a mission to make a difference. Each graduation gown that we make saves 28 plastic bottles from ending up in landfill or in the ocean. We break down the bottles and spin them into yarn producing a soft fabric that's indistinguishable from any other gown. What's more, we deliver everything straight to your front door. Who wants to spend their graduation day standing in line with this lot? Home delivery gives you more time to spend celebrating with friends and family and uh, this guy. And if Winston Turtle hasn't quite convinced you, our products cost up to 30% less to hire and 80% less to buy than other suppliers. Save money, save time and save the planet with Churchill Gowns. Part of the reason I wanted to show that is to illustrate the point that if, if you are a sustainable business, uh, especially a sustainable startup, that's all well and good, but actually you've only really done half the job. The other half is communicating that to your customers and your stakeholders. Um, and to give you an example of what I'm talking about, I was part of a panel discussion not so long ago where I was speaking to um, um, a biologist and he said, you know, if you wanted to save one animal, you would save krill or shrimp or something less plankton. Um, but of course, the, the emblem of saving wildlife is the polar bear or the lion or something like this. And what he was talking about there was this disconnect between what actually makes a massive difference and people's perception of what makes a big difference. And it's often the job of a startup to try to 
uh, translate, kind of bridge that gap um, and present things in a very palatable way. And so it's really important to be very concise and coherent and have a very short message. So for us, we say for every gown that, that we make, we are uh, using or recycling 28 plastic bottles. So it's a really, really simple message. Um, but that wasn't so easy to come up with to, to start off with. And actually, we were trying to be ethical and sustainable in lots and lots of ways. So we were carbon offsetting everything. Um, so everything that left our warehouse, everything from our fabric suppliers, everything that was being dyed, we were dyeing it with, with um, ethically sourced fabrics. Uh, we were vetting our manufacturers in a way that is, we're kind of going above and beyond. Um, we have a huge number of policies, um, whether it be um, tr trying to protect the environment, whether it being an equal opportunities employer, whether it being paying above the living wage, and actually trying to communicate all of these things, you can get lost in the noise a little bit. And so it's really important just to have kind of one key USB or one or two key USBs that you can present. Um, and actually kind of learned that the hard way. And I found that personally very difficult. I said, well, I want to do all these amazing things. And I think we can create a business that is ethical and sustainable and ticks all these boxes. Um, so it's quite frustrating to say, well, I want to tell the world that actually we've got all these great initiatives going on. Um, but it's important sometimes just to focus on a few. Um, otherwise, it can be a little bit too much. So going back to the business story, we assembled this team. Um, we then looked at trying to raise some investment. So we have been through a number of rounds of, of different forms of investment now. The first round was via a consortium of angel investors. So this is groups of uh, individuals. These are, these are private, not, not corporate investors, who are usually high net worth individuals. So they have a lot of uh, disposable income. Um, we have a consortium, so there's 25 of them have grouped together. And they did our seed round or what is kind of your, your first round of investments. They put about 300,000 pounds in. Um, after that, we were approached by the Dragon's Den and the Dragon's Den said, would you like to come on the show? Part of that is for investment, um, but part of that is because you were interested in exposure and the publicity that could come with that. Um, so we then uh, secured some investment from that. Since then, we've also done another round with our angel investors. So we're up to probably around 700,000 pounds of investment now, which is a really substantial amount of money. And you might think that's a huge amount of funding for what is essentially a very niche business in a pretty obscure industry. Um, and what I would say from my experience is it's not as um, daunting and terrifying and impossible as it may sound to go and find funding funding for your business. Um, the old banks um, are very difficult to go and get uh, capital from nowadays, but there are loads and loads of since kind of 2008 and since the financial crash, there are lots and lots of places where you can get funding, whether it be crowdfunding, places like CrowdCube Cedars, whether it be private individuals who now get tax relief from stuff called SEIS or EIS, so they get um, huge, huge tax incentives whether it be debt financing, there, there's lots and lots of access to money. So for any of you out there who are thinking of starting your own business, um, it's, it's not as terrifying and it, it's not as impossible as you might think to go and raise a decent amount of money. Um, there are some kind of ingredients that you will need, but um, like I said, I can, I can talk to people about that more um, if anyone has specific questions. So we launched the business and we recycled around 44,000 plastic bottles initially, making the garments um, that would be appropriate to use at about 18 universities. Um, we, since our inception, have been very much a B2C supplier, meaning we go directly to the consumers, directly to students. So students can go onto our website, they can select, uh, they can choose their university, whether it be Bedford or Cambridge or Coventry. They click on whether they're doing a bachelor's or master's and their gown gets sent straight to their door. Once they're finished, they put it back in a bag and, and they send it back to us. Um, so we started off with 18. We're now up to 60 universities and we've recycled closer to a quarter of a million plastic bottles. So that's a really nice goal to have outside of our kind of financial business goals that are to make money and to pay our investors back and to you know, do all the things that any corporation wants to do. It's also nice to have a real mission that kind of holds you accountable to, to what you should be doing. Um, part of our um, strategy to, to grow the brand was to raise our profile on campus. So you can see here we uh, partnered with various societies so we've sponsored things like polo clubs debate societies chess clubs we also hire student ambassadors 
Um, so it's a way that students can earn a little bit of money by promoting us and they get kind of paid a commission. Um, and we've also um, had various articles written about us in student magazines. So that's really, really great. And it's nice to talk about uh, the business and people's ability to have choice when it comes to renting their gown, you know, buy a sustainable gown or rent a sustainable gown at an affordable cost. Um, that's really, really great. But beyond that, we've also had a lot of exposure outside of the campus or outside of this, the university world. And um, we've, as, as you can see here, we've had articles in the Times, uh, in the Telegraph. Um, I was on the One Show and, and of course, Dragon's Den. Now, these things are all really great and any business needs exposure. You're never going to get customers, stakeholders, consumers. You're never going to grow your business and your brand unless you try and get exposure. But the difference between these two slides is some exposure you can control and some of it is to an extent out of your control. And when you go on a TV show, uh, it's edited and um, you then lose control of your narrative. Um, and you're also going to be under, if you are a sustainable business or an ethical business or a social venture, you are going to be under an extra amount of scrutiny. If you are claiming to be ethical or sustainable, then you have to be answerable to a lot more uh, questioning than your average business. Um, the truth is that saying that I am sustainable or whatever these products are sustainable, it's going to gain you a lot of customers um, and could garnish you quite a bit of respect, but you have to really be able to defend that. Um, and again, that's a lesson that we learned quite early on because our gowns were really, really well made, made of recycled plastic at a, at a much more affordable cost than our, than our competitors. But people started saying, well, you, you know, tell us, um, tell us about how you ship them. Uh, where do you buy them from? We have supplies in London, Poland, Romania, and China. How well have you vetted those? Um, and so, like I said, if you're going to claim something, you have to be able to back it up to an extra degree if you're going to be a, a social venture. Um, so what does the kind of, what are our future goals? Well, obviously we want to grow market share. Um, we're, we're really interested in this idea of changing consumer behaviors. Obviously, if somebody rents a sustainable gown or a plastic gown, that's not going to save the world, to be honest with you. 28 plastic bottles is great, um, but you know, the scale of the problem is absolutely vast. And this is a drop in the ocean. But if buying a sustainable gown then makes you think, ah, could I buy other things that could be more sustainable? Or could I um, uh, perhaps buy other clothing that's made from recycled polyesters? then we can kind of be a catalyst to a larger change. And if we can be part of that momentum, part of that movement, then, then that would be really incredible. Um, and that plays a part in kind of improving sustainability as a whole. Um, you can be a stepping stone to something much larger than your small industry or, or even your business. Um, just a few challenges that uh, I've experienced whilst trying to start my business that I think uh, are quite relevant. One of them is uh, brand identity. And I mentioned earlier, kind of losing control of your identity and, and, and how you can um, present your brand in a, in a kind of palatable way. Another thing to mention is who are your stakeholders? And actually for us, often the universities are people that we need to partner with. The parents often purchase the gowns for a lot of students. And they're really the people who care about graduation. Most students couldn't give a shit. It's, this, it's the parents who say, I need that picture of you on the mantle place. This is a really proud moment for me. Um, and then it's the students who are actually wearing it. So we've got kind of three different customer groups, all of which you have to appease, but are actually interested in completely different things. Um, so I've got a list of things here. You know, some are very interested in the affordability. We're up to 80% less than our customers. If you wanted to buy a gown from, uh, from Eden Ravenscroft, our, our competitor, you're looking at two, 300 pounds through ourselves, 70 pounds. So if you're the person buying it, like a student or parent, very, very important. If you're the university, the university doesn't pay, so that's less important to them. Um, and again, something I think is, is a really kind of useful lesson to learn. Don't always just think about your customers, but who are your other stakeholders that are going to care about your product and about uh, your kind of mission as a whole? Um, th this slide kind of illustrates this point. Um, and on the right hand side, you can see our website. Um, so you can see these kind of uh, interesting icons. You have the price guarantee, the convenient home delivery, the little turtle here about saving the planet. He's got a little bottle stuck on his head. Um, it's nice, it's colorful. It's, it's a bit more kind of student focused. And then you can see on the left hand side, you know, the fonts, the logos that we're using, it's changed a little bit. And the reason for that change is the, 
the sh screenshot on your left is actually from our catalog that we sent to institutions. Um, so again, just, just being aware of kind of different customer groups or stakeholders um, has, has been uh, really important for us. Um, and those two um, identities that we have, kind of customer facing and corporate facing, um, they can't kind of uh, uh, diverge too far apart from one another. Otherwise your brand becomes a bit incongruous and confusing things. So difficult to sometimes marry those two things up. Um, our other challenges that we've had is obviously for a graduation gown company, people will usually just buy a gown once. So how do you create ambassadors um, when you don't really have many repeat customers? Um, it's not a very exciting industry. I'll be the first person to admit there's very few people who are truly passionate about graduation gowns. It's just not that sexy. It's not that exciting. Um, so how do you grow a social media presence? Um, how do you engage customers when it, it's just not something that they're excited about in the way that they would with other uh, uh, products? Um, and it's not necessarily something people are excited to spend their money on. You know, given the choice, people would prefer a nice meal out, a few beers down the pub, a pair of trainers. You're not really excited about spending your 60 pounds on renting a gown. Um, and so these are things that we've kind of had to, um, ha had to deal with as we've kind of grown the company. So uh, the next short little bit is just some of the tips that perhaps um, might be useful to, to social entrepreneurs and some of the, again, the lessons that we've learned along the way. Um, firstly, we've innovated, not just in the product and lots and lots of entrepreneurs and startups that I speak to, they're all about innovating when it comes to the product. Um, and that I think is really important, but there are other areas you can innovate in. Um, a really great example of this uh, for anyone who's read the book Shoe Dog, I'd, I'd really recommend it, um, about Phil Knight who started uh, Nike. Um, but he, he did this um, future payment scheme whereby if people paid earlier, they would get a larger discount when they bought their trainers uh, for, for wholesale, which sounds such a simple thing, but actually this allowed him to improve his cash flow, which then meant he could order more stock in, um, and meant that Nike's growth was exponentially quicker. Um, now he innovated in his supply chain as well as making great shoes and, and having a great marketing campaign, but you don't really hear about the innovations in the supply chain, but those can be profoundly effective. Um, so one thing that we looked at doing was trying to innovate the ordering process. You can see our competitors website here on the right. You have to type in your institution. You have to create an account before you even buy something. Um, if you want to buy your gown, you have to upload a picture of your degree certificate, put in a student ID. It's really convoluted. It's kind of complex. And it's really needless. With ourselves, we looked at innovating this process to making it a little bit simpler and quicker. So it wasn't just the gown itself that we were trying to innovate, it was the ordering process as well. Um, another kind of top tip that I would give um, is when you have a business, you'll often come, you'll often create a very short elevator pitch, which is a two, three minute pitch that you'll give to investors or, or maybe even suppliers um, or other stakeholders. With an elevator pitch, you want to kind of quickly summarize what is the problem, how you're going to solve it, how will you make money, and how your research and analysis can, can substantiate you, the, the, these claims. Um, but one element that people always forget is why you? Why are you the person to create this business? Do you have some specific skill or experience? Um, and when I pitched to my first group of investors, uh, I found that really difficult to answer. I hadn't worked in fashion. I didn't um, have any great connection to where our manufacturers were. Um, I hadn't really worked in academia, so I didn't really know the university's perspectives. And I think all of my investors said, it's a great idea. There's huge profits to be made. Even if you take 10% market share, this is an 8 million pound a year business. That's a great business, can, can easily pay us a return. But why are you the guy to do it? Um, and, and that was something I struggled with. I struggled to answer and I think I was able to kind of navigate around that but if you were kind of sat there with a business idea that's a good thing to ask yourself kind of say well why am I you know am I particularly passionate do I have some particular insight or experience that maybe makes me a little bit unique in this industry um, because people do care about that even if it's just a fact that you've been interested in this for x number of years or you're kind of aware of things that other people aren't it just gives you that little bit of competitive advantage um, and investors financiers do like to see that um, and my final little tip is about pivoting. Um, we've had to pivot our business a lot over the last kind of few years. 
um, with, with different issues that have kind of come up. Um, and our latest pivot has been due to the coronavirus. Um, and with all of the graduations being cancelled or postponed, that's all of our revenue wiped out pretty much this year. So we came up with this home graduation in the box kit and it's got your graduation gown and a little teddy bear and champagne and chocolates and all the rest of it. And so this is aimed at, we market this really more towards parents, but also students. Um, and it allows people to buy the gown, take pictures at home and have a kind of a celebration. Um, and so again, being able to pivot and adjust your, your offering is really, really key when starting any startup. Um, most entrepreneurs will tell you, you know, five or six iterations where they've had to change their business and adapt to the environment. Um, and I can't think of a better example than, than coronavirus that will put lots of people out of business and probably the people that will survive will be able to adapt very quickly. Um, so again, a very, very, very kind of important tip. Um, those are all of my slides. I don't know how I'm doing for time, but thank you very much for listening. And, and like I said, I'll welcome any questions maybe towards the end.